of some really great information for communities that are wanting to uh, make the case that protecting our environment is also a good economic uh, decision, that it's the right thing to do and it uh, can be a good business decision. So we, we've got um, some great panelists up here that can help us make the business case for protecting the environment. Our first speaker is going to be Nate Bosch. Nate grew up in Michigan and received his doctorate in 2001 from the University of Michigan in the field of limnology. Nate is currently a professor at Grace College in, envir in the environmental science program where he teaches and leads uh, the team at the Lilly Center for Lakes and Streams. And in that role, Nate led an economic impact study to find out the value of Kosciuszko County's lakes. And he's going to report um, on what that study found and provide his thoughts. And hopefully we'll have some good questions for him, too. Our next uh, panelist is Nick Tillema. Uh, Nick has been involved in the real estate finance industry since 1972. His education includes a Bachelor of Finance from Indiana University, a Master's of Business Administration from Arizona State University, and a Doctorate of Jurisprudence, JD, um, from Indiana University in Indianapolis. Uh, he has also um, been involved in leasing and management with a Chicago-based regional shopping center owner. Uh, mortgage, he's been involved in mortgage banking. Uh, he was co-owner of a title company. Um, he's been involved in property management, real estate development, um, as well as assessing uh, commercial and real estate properties. Um, his experience in teaching includes uh, real estate broker and appraiser uh, pre-licensing classes, continuing education seminars, and real estate college classes for private schools, professional organizations, um, Indiana University, and Butler University. And he's written numerous uh, seminars for both law and real estate professionals. And then I don't have to introduce Tim Maloney because we all know him, our senior policy director, um, who will be talking about uh, Hoosier Environmental Council's work and our partners' work on the Nouns Greenway. So I'm going to turn it over now to Nate. Please write your questions down on those cards, too. All right, thank you. Okay, so economic impact studies as a tool for protecting our local waterways. I'm going to start with a little bit of context for where we work in Kosciuszko County in north central Indiana. Um, geographical context as well as sort of recreational context. Then I'll move into what are some motivating factors uh, for folks taking care of our waterways and then this specific study, uh, both the methods and results of that study. So first off, some context. So uh, here's where our county is located in the state, and we have over 100 lakes. We have about 600 miles of streams, including the Tippecanoe River, which is one of the top 10 most important rivers as designated by the Nature Conservancy. We have our largest natural lake, Lake Wawasee, our deepest natural lake, Lake Tippecanoe, and uh, we also have the North-South Continental Divide in our county. And so just to give a little bit of geographical uh, context. A little context on our organization specifically. Uh, we work uh, to make our lakes and streams cleaner and healthier and safer and more beautiful. And uh, we do that in three focus areas for our organization specifically. Uh, we um, do engaging education. We want to inspire the next generation of uh, water literate students. We also want to change behavior now um, for certain practices that are not helpful to our waterways. We want to use applied research to solve problems more strategically. Also, we can identify emerging threats that are coming into our communities as well. And then we also want to work in collaboration because we can be more effective and more efficient when we work that way. Let's move on to some motivating factors for taking care of waterways. Well, those of you who have spent time around lakes or streams in Indiana know uh, that they have a great impact on our quality of life. You can hopefully recognize that they also provide lots of recreational opportunities. They provide many of our community's sense of identity. They also provide for many family memories, thinking back to gathering at a lake shore or spending time year after year paddling on a local stream, for example. There's also the motivation of 
looking at the interconnections in nature itself. As an ecology professor, I just got done keep teaching an ecology class, and it's all about interconnections, right? And so we can look at food chains or food webs, and everything's interconnected, and that shows um, the importance of keeping these ecosystems intact and bringing them back to being intact when they are not. But the environment or someone's personal connection with a local lake or stream is sometimes not enough for motivating us to take care of those waterways. And so we embarked on a study, what if we could quantify the economic impact of our lakes? And so that's what we did. Here's some of the methods on that study. We wanted to look at business and property tax revenue coming into Kosciuszko County. As far as the business side goes, we involved 314 local businesses across the county. Uh, we used surveying, which had a 65% response rate. We also did, uh, we also utilized a lot of public data sources uh, to fill in any missing data that we needed. And an important thing to mention here, data not available, was not available for some businesses. So these study results that I'll show are conservative. We know that likely the economic impact is even higher than what we were able to quantify. On the property tax side, we know that property tax revenue, and, uh, and Nick will, will talk about this a little bit, with property values being tied to environmental quality, we know that as the environment gets better, or in this case, the lakes would get cleaner, that those property tax revenues would go up or down if these lakes would get dirtier. And so in our study then, we included the single family homes, we had to work with our county assessor and auditor offices, and we only looked at the specific lake portion of these homes. So let me explain it this way, if we were to have a uh, $200,000 home in the middle of a cornfield and we were to put that on to one of our lakes, it might no longer be a $200,000 home, but maybe a $1.2 million home, okay? So the million dollar portion of that, we would look at the tax generated by that, but not the 200000 Does that make sense? Just the lake portion of that inflated property value. So to look at some of the results, um, this is a, a graphic uh, that we were able to put together to show people visually, and I know the text is too small for you to read, but I just wanted to show this visually uh, so you could get a sense of this. $313 million annually comes into Kosciuszko County because of the lakes. And we broke that up for the business revenue side into lake-related businesses and lake-specific businesses. So lake-related businesses would be um, different um, auto sales or gas sales, retail places, food and dining, construction. We would talk to these business owners and get a sense of, of what portion of your annual sales are due to the fact that there are lakes in your community. And then getting those percentages and annual sales data, we were able to then pull out from that what the impact was specific to the lake, even though these businesses, most of which operate all year round. And then the lake-specific businesses are a little bit more straightforward, things like boat sales, boat manufacturing, marinas, bait and tackle, boat repair, some of these other sorts of things. And then as we talked about, the property taxes. So putting it in a format that's a little easier for you to read with the font size, the lake-specific businesses then for one year would bring in about $151 million. The lake-related businesses would bring into the county about $148 million, and the property taxes generated on just that lake portion of the value would be about $15 million. And so that's where we were able to come up with this estimated, estimated total of $313 million every year coming into our county due to the presence of those lakes. Some considerations I'd like to mention here these are conservative totals. We know likely they're, they're even higher. We also know that these are not static over time, which gives all of us in the work that we do uh, good encouragement to keep doing the work that we do because this economic driver can get better or worse depending on how our lakes are protected. 
and then that helps with investment in the lakes as well. Just so it's not all data, I thought some of this qualitative uh, information that came from the study would be helpful to bring up to you all as well. Here's some quotes taken from business owners uh, through the surveying process, which I think are helpful. Uh, large manufacturing company said, we may not be headquartered here. Uh, they actually um, found their niche in Kosciuszko County because of the lakes and the quality of place. A uh, lakeside residents restaurants said, from our annual sales, 80% comes between Memorial Day and Labor Day. A lakeside retreat center said, we would not be here. I'm sure the site was chosen because of access to water. A lake-related professional services business said, and not an, we, would not, we do not have enough business to sustain. We would have to close the doors. And a lake-specific recreational equipment business, we would not exist. The lakes fuel 100% of our company goals and mission. So hopefully that are, those are some good things for you all to think about um, as we look at a lake economic impact study and what we're able to find in our county. And I think in the questions we'll get a little bit more into the application for the rest of the state too. Uh, uh, the war effort altogether. 
after the war, it was used as a pest repellent and poison, and poison rats and whatever. And, um, and Rachel Carson saw in her community that uh, it was kind of getting involved in the food chain. So there was lots of uh, animals that were not, uh, not being able to make it. So she called attention to that in her book. Her book became very popular and became kind of a crusade at one point in time from 62 to 1970. It was a major situation. 1970, or 1969, I guess, when President Nixon created the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And it wasn't until a decade later that we, the government created a CERCLA. And uh, CERCLA was the Superfund Act, and basically what the Superfund Act said is that if you have damage, if you have a property been environmentally damaged, you had to clean it up. And if you bought it from somebody who knew that it was damaged when you bought it, they have to help you clean it up. And it goes back to the time that whoever owned the property damaged it. And so the damages were considered joint and several liability, which meant that if, uh, if you owned the property and uh, couldn't afford to have it uh, fixed, then somebody else in that chain would be able to fix it, and they would fix it. So you, uh, you stood the chance of uh, having some major concerns, and, and the circle uh, did, did a lot of good for us. It was, uh, re in the, it was redone in uh, 1986, I believe it was, with SARA, which is the Superfund Adjustment Readjustment Act, Authorization Readjustment Act. And so uh, it, it basically put some innocent defense situations to it. It helped banks that might find themselves in the chain of time. And all of that was good, but still there was this damage situation that we needed to discuss. And so as, um, as we started, as we started through the, uh, uh, the state of Indiana in terms of uh, what can we do and how that's going to work, the state uh, had their own environmental uh, laws, and many of which have been put together within the last decade or so. And so when it comes time for somebody to uh, have some concerns about uh, what's going on, the, uh, and they find themselves in a courtroom. And the state programs here are generally rate-based, uh, risk-based cleanup programs and uh, uh, petroleum remediation, dry cleaning remediation. So there's a number of laws at the state level will help us to determine where there is liability. Unfortunately, they tell us about the liability and uh, don't generally talk in terms of about how the uh, damage calculation should be. Over the period of time, the courts have kind of helped in that situation, but the Appraisal Institute, which is a, a professional organization that real estate appraisers generally go, uh, abide by, um, has been created, and excuse me, the Appraisal Foundation, which kind of sets the standard by which real estate appraisers have to appraise, uh, have created a, an advisory opinion on how to appraise uh, con uh, contaminated properties. It's called Advisory Opinion 9, and it's very specific in terms of what we need to do in terms of the before-after calculations and so on. One of the main things that it did for us was to really kind of set the, uh, the, the tone for how this needs to be done. So there are the various applicable standards that, are, that need to be held into, uh, in, into whatever report that uh, I as an appraiser prepare for the courts. And uh, this extraordinary assumption of hypothetical conditions are ways for the appraiser to communicate with the court in terms of if, if this happened, then this happened, and so on. And, and basically, the uh, hypothetical conditions are created for a before-after analysis. In other words, uh, what is the property worth today if it had not been contaminated? What is it? And that, that concept of it not being contaminated would be a hypothetical condition. And what is the uh, property worth today as contaminated? And the difference between those before and after turns out to be the damages involved. There's also other kinds of, uh, and of course you back talk about competency, because not all appraisers uh, work in this particular area. Um, so what we find is that there are a number of ways that the uh, damages can, can occur. Uh, we, we make sure that the uh, uh, permitted accident release and there's some type of regulatory compliance is involved. But really what's going on is that the, the advisory opinion nine gives us the definitions of things that we need to, uh, 
to be able to use within our report. And just as the, uh, whatever profession you're in has its own nomenclature for certain things, so does the legal community. Generally, if you are an attorney and you are uh, in a courtroom, you need to use the same language that the court uses so that we're not kind of disturbed by, by different kinds of definitions. And the same is true of real estate appraisers. And so we find that such things as uh, the source and non-source and adjacent to the product or to the concern, the cost and the timing of the remediation, uh, the diminution in value of the property, it's just the difference between the impaired and the unimpaired property property values, uh, the environmental contamination is defined, the uh, environmental risk is defined. All of these are ways in which the appraiser needs to be able to talk in terms of the courtroom, because the court is going to be talking in the same way. The impaired value, for instance, or uh, what, the, what kind of remediation costs are involved, and what kind of remediation life cycle is involved. The life cycle, for instance, says that uh, if there is a contamination on a particular property, how much of that is, uh, is due today and how much will be due down the road a little bit? So it turns out that once a, uh, a concern is recognized and we find out that there might be some contamination, the property values drop dramatically because nobody knows exactly what's going on. As a phase one and a phase two happen, we understand exactly what the problem is and how that problem needs to be fixed. It, it puts a floor to the bottom of that uh, dropping real estate value, and then from then on, it kind of gets up a little better because of the remediation process. And what we found in that process is that if there is a contamination and if there is a remediation involved, the remediation can take the property all the way back to what's considered clean. And what's considered clean is the state uh, definition. In other words, the, the federal government through EPA and the state government through the environmental had, uh, Department of Environmental Protection both have uh, guidelines about what type of contamination is considered clean. Radon, for instance, if you have a, a home that might have radon, the way that radon is measured is through what a, a measurement called peaks, P-I-Q-U-E-S, and peaks. If you have four peaks or more of radon in your house, it's considered contaminated. Uh, if you have three peaks of radiation in your house, it's not con officially considered contaminated. So what happens when the remediation process ha is it completed, the process makes it sure that it's completed according to the state and federal levels, but it might still be contaminated. And so there's an additional risk involved, and it's called stigma. That would be the market resistance to a property even after it had been completely remediated. There is still a bit of market resistance, and that we find is a, a very important part as we start into calculating the damage of, on real estate. Um, there are a number of methods and techniques for appraising uh, real, real estate in itself. Generally, there are three is called. Uh, the cost approach, the sales comparison approach, and the income approach are the basic traditional models of uh, real estate valuation. Uh, those are heavily relied on, on by the court. And so if I put an appraisal together that uh, discusses what I think the value loss might be, uh, if I haven't included how I came up with the cost approach, income, and sales comparison approach, the court might not agree with me and throw it out of the, out of the court altogether. We have to use the, uh, the techniques that are available, um, except that when it comes to uh, specialized valuation methods like real estate appraising or contaminated properties, we find that there's some specialized methods. And the first one is considered the paired sales analysis. And what we do with paired sales analysis is if we find a property that's been contaminated and has sold, and we find another property that's exactly like it has not sold, or excuse me, and has sold, uh, we can see the sold versus the impaired versus the unimpaired value and make some type of prediction about what, what's happening on our property. That uh, sure sounds good, but there's not that many of those sales out there, so it's difficult to, to, uh, to make that work. An environmental case study is generally a large study that uh, is uh, including a number of properties so that uh, uh, we can see what's happened over a broad period of areas and, uh, and perhaps bring that back. 
Uh, if there is enough information, we can use multiple regression analysis, which is a fancy term for uh, using statistics analysis in order to come up with uh, some kind of value loss. And finally, there's this income capitalization process. So this, uh, as when we would do the paired sales analysis, for instance, what we would generally do is try to find as many comparable sales as we can, because the courts are certainly interested in finding out what the market says is going on about these kinds of uh, concerns. Um, environmental case studies, um, my partner and I were involved in a uh, case study in the southern part of uh, Indiana, basically on the Ohio River. And what had happened is that there was a PCB uh, contaminant on the river and it affected a specific community. We were able to go back five years prior to the contamination and get all the information about the housing sales prior to. And we were able to track about where those property values should have gone. And then there was a specific time when the contamination was recognized and it took another three or four years for it to uh, get remediated and then we were able to track it after that. So we were able to be able to to present one of these case studies that kind of indicates what's going on because of certain problems. Again, when uh, when it comes to multiple regression analysis, we we did this one of the first times they did it with, with the Indianapolis International Airport. At that point in time, the airport was getting expanded and they moved the runway from one just a little bit. But what they ended up doing was. Uh, putting the noise level at certain subdivisions much greater than it had been before. And so uh, we were involved in uh, calculating how much that value had gone down and, uh, and several, and using regression analysis to do that. Uh, and then the impaired value by the income approach is basically, there are times when real estate values go down because the rent that you're able to charge goes down, and then there's times when the values go down because the general rate of uh, that what we consider the capitalization rate is uh, involved. Now, there are a number of ways that you can clean up uh, real estate damages. Uh, but the, the fact is that there are generally three types of contamination. It is the contamination that's above the ground, the contamination that's on the ground, or the contamination that's below the ground. And each one of those has to be handled in a separate different way. When we talk about contamination above the ground, uh, well, here's a couple of case studies. Let's talk first about the contamination on the ground. Uh, 1999, uh, Guide Corporation purchased a manufacturing facility from uh, General Motors in Anderson, Indiana. Uh, as Guide was taking the material, the, the equipment out of the building, they put it outside and washed it down with the solvent. That uh, solvent. Uh, was generally the type of solvent they'd always been using, but they had never used it in that high of a concentration. It went in through the uh, uh, sewage system and went directly into the White River and caused a 50 mile complete killing of all the fish, dead fish with 50 mile river. Uh, we were involved in that uh, uh, surplus was used by the state of Indiana to sue guidance for the, the concern because uh, if you remember back then, they, there was like 300 and some dump trucks that were in the Indianapolis area and along the river that picked up those uh, fish and, uh, and disposed of them. So they were sued for the expense. And then there were a number of homeowners along the riverbank that also sued in terms of how their values had gone down as well. So it was a complicated affair. But that contamination on the water, and many times, contamination on the water or contamination on the ground is remediable, something that you can take care of. Uh, when we start talking about uh, contamination on uh, below the ground, it's a completely different animal. Now, we've, we've had a number of uh, uh, contamination below the ground where we've been involved. Uh, contamination could be gas stations. It can be uh, dry cleaning operations. It could be PCB. There's a number of ways that the property can be contaminated. The problem with the contamination in that respect is that you can find where the contamination is, dig it out, and dig it until you uh, don't have any concern anymore, and, and then you would put fresh soil back in where you just dug the bad soil out, and then hope you've got it. The problem is, is that you don't know for sure if you've got all the contamination when you remediate them below ground things. And so that's where that stigma comes in. 
uh, if you have a property that's never been contaminated or one that had been contaminated and remediated, there might still be a chance that the remediated the contamination might come back. In the last case study we talked about here is the contamination above ground, which is the odors or the light or the, uh, uh, the smells or whatever that can come um, from outside of, of your, your property area that would affect the value. And that's the end where that uh, con containment uh, animal feeding operation, the CAFOs have uh, kind of taken front and center stand for us for a while in terms of uh, what happens to the value of your property if somebody decides to build a uh, capo within a quarter of a mile of your house, right? And in the situation we were involved in in Hendricks County, uh, there was an elderly couple that owned that house quarter of a mile, and the house was downwind of the uh, of the capo. Uh, they weren't able to stay there during the summer months when it was hot. There's just no way to get away from the smell. Uh, and, Really sad situation. So we were able again at that point in time, talking to, uh, to calculate what we thought the damages were. So all of those are damage calculations that uh, we work hand in hand with the attorney to uh, try to make something uh, happen in the courtroom. Uh, in general, in my in my presentation, if you have any questions, be happy to answer them later. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention, uh, because Nick was not telling the importance of that last story, uh, the couple that he mentioned that lived next to a capo is one that um, we're representing, uh, AGC is representing in court, and if it weren't for Nick's um, evaluation, we would not have been able to survive a summary judgment motion that was brought to kick that case out. So um, that this type of assessment is very, very critical. Good afternoon again, uh, and I did. I was reminded to mention uh, that if you have any questions, please write those down. We'll try to have a, a maybe a couple minutes for questions, and we can always consider them in the breakout sessions afterwards. Uh, I'm going to expand a little bit on on the, in, the type of information that Nate talked about to a broader national and state level uh, in terms of the value of, of investing in. Protecting our wild areas, wildlife, and outdoor recreation opportunities. Uh, and this bear here that you see on your screen there, he's uh, on the phone, he's saying, Show me the money. So, just an uh, inspirational quote here from Teddy Roosevelt, who, uh, uh, in, in many ways, was part of the founding of the modern conservation movement. And, in the United States along with President Benjamin Harrison, who was a Hoosier, and of course John Muir, who founded the Sierra Club. So in terms of the business case for protecting wildlife and wild places, uh, there are uh, several ways that the, that value can be quantified. And so I'll talk about the value of ecosystem services, the value of uh, quality of life, and the value of so let's start with ecosystem services. These are the services that the plants and animals uh, on the planet provide to make life possible, whether it's clean air and clean water, or, uh, or waste treatment, or pest control, or pollination. Uh, those are all services that, that we get for free, that the life on the planet provide us and help us make our life possible. Uh, but there have been many attempts to try to quantify the value of that, and, and a lot of estimates put the value of global ecosystem services at over $50 trillion annually, and that's probably a, a low estimate. Uh, so obviously, you, everybody knows about the value of um, uh, pollination to, uh, to our food supply, and it's very important to food production in Indiana. Uh, nationally, uh, animal pollinators, uh, the service that they provide to, uh, to food production in America is estimated at 25 to $45 billion a year. 
and one third of our U.S. diet is supported by the pollination of honeybees. Uh, and in Indiana, crops that are very dependent upon uh, animal pollination include tomatoes, cantaloupes, uh, berries, apples, cucumbers, uh, and those are those are considerable industries. Another element of ecosystem services to food production is pest control. This is an Indiana batch you're looking at up there. Uh, there was a recent study uh, done on the value of the contribution of bats to American agriculture in terms of pest control, and that estimate was uh, anywhere from $3.7 to $53 billion a year uh, in the value that having healthy bat populations provides to, to American agriculture. In Indiana, wheat is our fourth largest uh, crop by production value, uh, and one of the principal pests of wheat is a fly called the Hessian fly, and that's a favorite food for our native bats. Pollination, uh, talked about that as well, and the value of pollination. Uh, we have, in Indiana, over 400 species of native bees. I'm sure that may be a surprise, that statistic to people. And 10 native honeybees. And uh, they, uh, so many of our crops and flowering plants depend upon our, both our native bees and uh, honeybees, both managed and wild populations, to uh, supply our, the food and beverages that, uh, that we all enjoy. Uh, the native bees, that the bumblebees that pollinate tomatoes use what's called buzz pollination. and they, they, they hover above the plants and buzz until the pollen falls off on the, on, on the tomato plants. And our native bees, in most instances, are more effective to pollinators than honeybees. So ecosystem services also help support our forests and the forest products industries. Uh, the birds that live in our, our native birds that live in our forests uh, consume gypsy moths, emerald ash borers, and leaf in eating insects. So the birds that you like to look at every spring when uh, the outside world is greening up are also helping keep those forests healthy uh, and controlling pests that are very harmful to, to trees both from an ecological standpoint and from a, a commercial standpoint. Uh, and they're Every spring when our migratory songbirds come back, think about not only that it's, it's enjoyable to go out and watch them and listen to their songs, but they are arriving at the same time that le the leaves are coming out and all the bugs that eat leaves are descending upon our trees and those birds are arriving just in time to start feasting on them. So it's a, it's a great service in terms of the health of our forests. I also wanted to talk about uh, resiliency amid climate change as, as one of the important ecosystem services. Uh, protecting natural lands has great value for uh, uh, providing natural flood control. So if we conserve lands uh, along our waterways, uh, that helps store, store flood waters and reduce downstream flood damages. And, and this is a case study of of the value of a greenway in Missouri to, to preventing flood damages every year. And of course our forests are great carbon sinks, uh, storing a tremendous amount of carbon uh, and uh, also helping clean our air quality and, um, and providing habitat. So that's another uh, great ecosystem. Forests are basically our global lungs that help uh, protect our our air supply as well as store huge amounts of carbon. <coughs> I'll move on to quality of life. Uh, a lot of talk about quality of life and, and the role of, of outdoor amenities, outdoor spaces, and, and contributing to quality of life and making communities livable. I know uh, Mayor Fetters talked about that earlier and, and <laughs> as well. Uh, so just a couple quotes here over the next couple of slides about how so many different uh, economic interests are talking about quality of life as part of economic development. Uh, this survey about um, from the American Planning Association talking about uh, 
quality of life amenities are a more uh, valuable business recruitment strategy than, uh, than traditional business recruitment strategies, which is uh, quite often tax credits. Uh, in the city of Carmel, a, a city councilor told us they don't spend any money on tax credits and business incentives. Their business incentive program is quality of life, and that's where they invest their money. Uh, regional cities, I think Mayor Fetters talked about the regional cities program. Uh, in this region of the state was one of the three regions that benefited from a significant state investment in, in quality of life and regional cooperation. Those were the two key elements of the regional cities program. Echoing the finding that the people don't follow jobs, they follow, they move to places that have the type of community where they want to live, and then the jobs follow the people. So I'll run through some uh, recreation and tourism statistics real quickly. Uh, the amount of money that uh, is produced by outdoor recreation and tur tourism is really quite substantial in Indiana. According to a 2017 study, over 16 or nearly $16 billion is spent every year on outdoor recreation in the state. Creates leads to 143,000 direct jobs and over a billion dollars in state and local taxes. Uh, this is from finding of the Outdoor Industry Association that produces reports every five years. They all, you can also sort their reports state by state and, and by congressional districts. You can see of the uh, $16 billion spent in Indiana, in Northeast Indiana, the third congressional district, uh, that spending is about $1.25 billion. Tourism, which in many cases has overlap with, uh, with outdoor recreation, is also a considerable economic powerhouse. Uh, contributing about over $12 billion a year to Indiana's economy. And just going to highlight a few of the more localized findings around the country about the value of outdoor recreation. The Great Allegheny Passage, which is a long distance uh, biking and hiking trail in Pennsylvania and Maryland. About 30% of all the business revenue in the towns along that trail is attributed to the presence of the trail, and that equates to about a million dollars per establishment. And then I certainly want to mention the report that we had done for our Mount Greenway project, which again uh, verifies the great value of, of not only creating trails and greenways, but conserving, uh, conserving our rivers and, concern, and conserving lands along our rivers. Economic health and environmental benefits analysis indicated that this 15 to 17 mile greenway along the White River between Muncie and Anderson would generate on completion about $13 million in annual health, environmental, and economic benefits, as well as a one time property value increase at the conclusion of the project of about $33 million, which is entirely consistent findings with the studies that are done around the country. And um, just move through the uh, rest of the slides here. We also have reports from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about the value of wildlife associated recreation in, in America and Indiana. Uh, this is fishing and hunting and uh, wildlife watching activities. And in uh, 2011, uh, Hoosiers and our visitors spent nearly $2 billion a year on these activities. So I think that the point of, of talking about the hard dollar numbers uh, when it comes to, to conserving our wild places and wildlife is that that's, uh, is to make the point that this is not something we want, it's something we need, and there are a variety of reasons why we need to do this and need to commit to this investment, and not just because it's something that also provides intrinsic value and non-monetary value. So for many of us, that may be why we care about this. But people that control budgets tend to care about hard, hard numbers like jobs and, and return on investment. And investing in uh, conserving our resources is a great investment with lots of, of valuable returns. And um, But a lot of us still care about it because it refreshes our, our human spirit 
lets us get away from the pressures of, of modern day society and, uh, and connect with nature. For a lot of us, that's why we do it, but there's also other reasons why we should do this as well. So coming up in the future, again, uh, we'll have a budget session coming up and HEC will be there working on, on uh, environmental, uh, the environmental budgets and environmental appropriations, including a uh, proposal we're working on with our, a lot of partner organizations through the Indiana Conservation Alliance uh, to promote what we are calling uh, the Indiana Outdoor Stewardship Act, and we'll talk more about that in one of the breakout sessions. So thank you. Please bring me questions, but to start us off while they come up here, I'd like to post this actually to Nate. Um, what are your, just kick us off, actually all the panelists should weigh in on this question. What, is there anything we need to worry about in um, putting a value, a monetary value on our um, environmental resources? Test, okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm teaching an environmental ethics class right now, and we talk about this a lot, the different motivators for taking care of the natural environment around us. So personally for myself, I'm a Christian. I believe God created the world around us, and the Bible has a lot of biblical principles through it about how to take care of the environment. And when the creator of the universe says, hey, you should take care of the environment, well, that's kind of compelling for me. But um, that might not be compelling for everybody else. But whatever that compelling motivator is, that's a good thing because it moves people towards taking care of the environment. So I, well, personally, I, I maybe don't really like the idea of like just bringing it down to the dollar and cents level. The end result is a good thing because we take better care of it. Anybody feel free to take this one. Um, how have you communicated the results of your work on this and, and what has been the reaction? Anybody can feel it. I, I don't think it particularly applies to me. I, as, uh, you know, I, uh, I do damage assessments and uh, help attorneys come up with uh, an idea of how those damages can be supported in a courtroom. Uh, and so that there are certain people that look out for me to, to look through the internet trying to find me and others don't. So I, I don't particularly go out and try to find business, sorry. Yeah, so I think whenever you can come up with a major take-home message and then you can hand it off to a graphic designer to make it look really pretty and be really compelling, I think that's a, a really cool um, sort of interdisciplinary thing that we can we can make happen. And then sharing it with stakeholders in various formats, whether it's presentations or handouts using some of those graphic design elements. Um, meeting with key leaders, I think, often can be helpful too, to get some of these results, these economic results out to the general public. And um, yeah, I think, it, I think it, it can be then really powerful in that way. Great. Um, and here's another one for, for anyone that wants to take it. Um, what initial steps would a community member that wants to relay your, the information that they've learned here, um, what would be the steps that they would need to take to do that, be the best way to implement what you, what you shared with us? Yeah, I think one of the first ways you want to do that is, is make sure that local leaders, and particularly local business business officials are aware of this information and, uh, and are educated about both the presence and the value of uh, valuable natural resources in their community, whether it's freshwater lakes or a, a great river that can contribute to both recreation and economic development, uh, and the importance of, of having those amenities to quality of life because that's that's at the centerpiece now of economic development theory and practice virtually around the world. And, but we still need to make sure that our decision makers know that. 
I, I might also suggest that uh, there's, there, there's going to be a time and where uh, more of what we're trying to do here today is recognized by the, the American public. Uh, and there, that might not be tomorrow, and it might not be the day after, but there will be a time. So in the meantime, it seems like the best way to uh, work our way through that is to help uh, those that are polluting understand what they're doing. And uh, when you see some of the uh, technology, some of the advancements that have been made over the last 10, 15 years, you know, it's really, really kind of interesting. Not only are the advancements being made not particularly on a straight line basis, but maybe exponentially. So uh, we're seeing more and more interesting stuff happen all the time. When you look at the dairy farmers, for instance, there's that operation in Fair Oaks where they have almost 12,000 head of cattle within a very small portion of the uh, acreage area. Uh, 12,000 head of cattle. That's a lot of water that can pull out of the ground to turn into milk, and that's a lot of bad stuff that kind of goes back out, right? And so all of that manure and um, stuff is being uh, pulled back into one operation in which they turn it into methane gas and then turn the methane gas into electricity through generators. So all of a sudden, something that is could be very harmful for our uh, ecology is now doing something good. And I think we're going to see more and more of that kind of stuff all the time. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you that. But I, it, I, I'm going to take um, moderator privilege and, and actually pose one of my own questions. And, and just for some background, this question is for you, Nick. Um, I know that one of the, the assessment that you did for us in the um, Hendricks County case was used in Bartholomew County by the tax uh, county tax assessor there to realize that. Um, Cavos there had, was, were causing a property value loss to folks who lived around there. So my question for you is, how can people who live next to Cavos that want to do the same thing, what is the most effective way um, for them to communicate with county assessors on this issue, if, if you have thoughts on that? Well, there's the, the, the appellate process, and when your property taxes come out, you have an opportunity to appeal, and that's the best time to do this. The idea behind that is that uh, you can contact my, myself or people like myself that are involved in this type of activity. Uh, but there's also a lot of studies going on in terms of uh, how property values are uh, affected within a quarter mile, within a half a mile, within one mile, upstream or downstream from the uh, major airflows. I mean, there's some really good empirical study that has been done that in fact, I need to look for, and it's not that difficult for you to do as well. But that's all through that appellate process. And have you, um, this is for you, Nate, have you seen um, a reaction to the, the lake study that you did in Kosciuszko County? Has that helped to improve practices there and policies there? If yeah. So, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting things that happens is as we're sharing that story with people, people are able to start to make personal connections. For example, yeah talking about the, the economic impact for someone who owns a business in one of the towns near one of our lakes who maybe doesn't always understand the lake impact, but when you can start to talk about the economic vitality of that community tied to the lake, suddenly then how they operate their business becomes more interesting for them in relation to our local waterways or talking to a local agricultural producer that then understands what he or she does on his or her field has an impact on the schools that his or her grandkids are going to or the roads that he or she are riding on or, or some of the other infrastructure sorts of things as well. And so I think it can get really powerful. The other cool thing it did for our community is our community, Kosciuszko County, is known for orthopedics. And so everyone's sort of like, hey, that's the, that's the big sort of economic driver and then you have agriculture which people kind of know is well that's kind of out there as well but what this did was this showed lakes right on the same level as agriculture so obviously orthopedics are far and away the, the top economic driver but you have lakes and agriculture both um, right at number two and number three both right around 300 million dollars in our county and it so suddenly it 
raises the perception of the lakes and how we should take care of them. Thank you. Big round of applause for our panel.